kind of beginning to go over some new things here is um, I want to kind of introduce some of these items that are up here along the top and just kind of show what some of these things mean right here. So um, for instance, one thing you'll see me do sometimes is you'll see me click on this icon right here and I'm going to hover my mouse over and it's called wireframe on shaded. And what that does is it just projects a wireframe onto your shaded model. Um, so like that. And so that, you know, for some people that, that can kind of get in the way a little bit and for some people that's helpful, but I just want you to know that that button's right there. Um, additionally, on a shaded object like this, I'll turn it back off for a moment again here, is um, if you go under here under shading, you can see that I can go into wire, the wireframe mode right there as well. And you can see the shortcut is written right next to it, which is four. So if I click on that, this um, uh, wireframe, and then I can go to smooth shade all right there. But additionally, there is another helpful one that can come in handy sometimes. And um, that is going down to shading and then kind of skipping some of this and then going down to X-ray right here. And so when you go to X-ray, you have a little bit of shading on your model, but you can still see through it like a wireframe. So if, so if the wireframe is a little bit too much transparency for some of you, that X-ray mode is available. So again, that's shading and then X-ray right here. Um, that same button, and this again is kind of going back to that theme of Maya uh, having a lot of ways to do the same thing here is if you look at this button right here and remember if you just hover your cursor over something it'll give you a description of what that button is. So that same thing is found right here. So it's this little uh, it's two boxes kind of overlapping each other right there and that's the x ray mode, which you can find right there. And. Um, so that's just like a, another helpful mode that you can kind of uh, have for, for viewing right there. Two helpful modes is wireframe on shaded, which is this button, and then x-ray, which is a form of shaded that um, lets you see through the object a little bit. And again, that can be helpful when you're selecting vertices and things like that, and you can kind of see through, through the box or through the model that you're working on right there. And it's just that button right there. So. Um, Continuing to move here, does anyone have any questions about that um, uh, that review of what we talked about last class? Online, are you all good over there? Cool. So uh, next up, I want to introduce the idea of, um, I'm trying to decide which is the best of these two things to show first. I'm going to go ahead and start with beveling here. So we've gone over extruding right here, and there's still some more things we need to learn about extruding, but I'm going to switch over to, to beveling and then move back to extrusion again here. Um, so to bevel something, I'm going to just make a new model right here. So I'll just make a new cube. And I'm going to leave it. You know, what? I'm going to keep this model real simple here, but I'm just going to give it two across the board and subdivisions. OK. And so to, to bevel something, um, hopefully everyone's familiar with what a bevel is, here, but I'm going to, going to show it here as well. I mean, a bevel in real life rather than in 3D. But so a bevel, you can either uh, use um, faces or edges to create bevels. And to start things off, I recommend that you start with an edge right here. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, changed my mind. I'm just going to do an even simpler cube. OK, so to start off with beveling, I suggest uh, using edges right here. So I'm going to select the top edges of this cube right here. So I'm going to right click and go to edge mode. And you can select these top four edges right here just by holding shift. And you can drag and select like this. Or you can just tap the edges like that and create the selection. Additionally, just another quick way to do it, which is the way I'll do it if this cube were more complicated, is I would quickly go over to my side view by just tapping spacebar and then tapping spacebar again um, over the side view or using this button right here to go to the orthographic view. And you can just do a drag and select like this. So I can drag and select that whole area, selecting the edges, and then do a control and select to deselect those, those edges right there. And you can just kind of quickly have a bunch of edges selected at the same time right there. Um, another way 
is, which I don't think it's going to work on this model, is, yeah, it's not going to work here, is a lot of times you remember if you select an edge and you double click it, it'll select an edge loop, but it won't work just for a simple cube right here. So anyway, that's a few different ways that you can select that um, those top edges right there. And so with those um, four edges selected at the top of the cube, if I just press bevel right here, this is going to happen. And it's going to create a bevel right there. And it's going to give me a similar menu as with an extrusion. And I want to keep that menu up because uh, I want to worry about these three areas right here. So the fraction is the size of the bevel. So you can type in a number numerically right here. You can drag, you can hover your cursor over where the word fraction is and drag left or right. So dragging it across like this is pretty difficult to get the right amount because this is measured in uh, centimeters right here. And it's just, this object is pretty small. So it's pretty hard to dial in the right number. So a lot of times I'll just dial in whatever number I want it to be. So I'll type 0 0.05 here to get this size bevel right here. Um, in this instance, just so you all can see it well, I'll do 0.15. So it's a little bit, got a little more size to it here. So um, that's the size of the bevel right there. Segments is exactly the same as with an extrusion, where if I, I can type in more numbers right here. So I'll, I'll give it four and you can see right there. Let's go ahead and give it like eight. So you can see it gives it eight segments right there. Um, and so what it does is you can see how the bevel went from a hard edge to kind of a more rounded edge right there. If you look at that, so that's eight. And then I'm going to type in one. So that's one right there. So if you want a hard bevel, you can just type in one right there. And if you want to round it out, you need to add more geometry. And that's true for anything in Maya is if you want things to have a rounded out look, that usually means you need to add more geometry to it. So um, I'll just type in five this time. And continue to look through this. So that's the fraction is the size, segments is the number of detail or the number of um, polygons contained within the bevel. And next is the depth. And so this is going to either be a value of negative one to zero to one. And I'll show what that means. If you drag, if so if I type in number three, it's, uh, oh, whoops, what am I doing? Uh, here we go. There we go. So you can type in a number three, you just don't want to because it did something weird there. But um, so uh, a normal bevel looks like this, which is uh, one. And then if I type in zero, it's going to go back to that hard bevel again right there. And then if I type in negative one right here, it goes into like an inverted bevel right there. So if you're thinking about like modeling antique furniture or something like that, for example, um, sometimes you might want to set this to negative one to have a bevel that's kind of inside, rounded inside like this. Um, and sometimes you want it set to one where it's rounded out like that. Um, and once you have the bevel that you want, you can just press Q to get out of it here. Um, one thing that's really, really important with beveling here, and it's a common mistake I see with beveling, is notice how I selected all the edges going around the cube right here. So um, you want to have like an entire edge loop selected before you bevel something. And a bevel is not a fix-all. It's, uh, it's it, an extrusion is a much broader, more useful tool. And a bevel is very useful, but don't use it for everything. There's, um, it, there's kind of a time and a place for it here. So um, what I'm going to do here, just to continue to show this, is I'm just going to create another extrusion just to pull this out. And I'm going to demonstrate um, what it's like if you don't select an entire edge loop, and then you try to bevel here. So let's just say, for example, that I select one, two edges right here, and then I try to create a bevel out of this. You can't get a good look out of this, but it's um, it causes a problem with geometry. And that problem with geometry is if you look at this model right here, the geometry is good so far. And what that means is every face on here, right? So if we click on any of these faces right here, it's got one, two, three, four edges to it. And on all your models, um, you're, you're always going to want it to have four edges on it rather than five or three or six or seven. Um, because essentially, if you have a five-sided face, 
the amount, uh, there's two problems. It's, 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 called, it's creating something called an ingon. And the problem with that is when you go to smooth it, it can create some really weird shapes on you. And then the other problem is that if you try to build off of it anymore, say for instance, you try to extrude a five-sided edge or sorry, a five-sided face, um, the extrusion is gonna go a little wonky on you or very wonky on you. So you just typically wanna try to keep it to four, four sides whenever you're modeling here. And so when I create an extrusion, where for instance, I select two edges like this and then I extrude, oh, I'm sorry, a bevel, um, like this, and I'll drag the fraction to be, I'll do 0.3 this time just to keep it rather large. And then I'm gonna add segments into it like this. So when you look at it, this model looks, looks okay, right? So let me turn off the wireframe on shaded and you can see it largely looks all right. And if hypothetically I was done with the model at this point, that could be okay, but, and I see this a lot, like when people are trying to construct more complicated things like a, like a spaceship or a mech or something where you're, you're trying to create these complicated objects is if we turn around and look at the, the backside right here, this face right here has um, one, two, three, four, and then however many extra face, you know, sides it is right there. So it looks like it has about 12 sides to it. And if I were to extrude this, so if I were to try to take this face and adjust it some more by extruding it, um, you can kind of see, oh, wow, that got that wasn't as crazy as it usually is. Let's see here. <laughs> um, so uh, we're kind of getting away with it so far. But there's, um, how do I say this? There's, there's a lot of times where you, um, create this extrusion and uh, continue to work on it. And a lot of the times it'll kind of go crazy right there. I kind of got lucky this time. But then if I press three right here, you can kind of see like when it's time to smooth it, you kind of, you want clean geometry happening. And then if we look back here, we can see these, um, these ridges starting to form. And do, do you see this in the model right here where you can see these facets beginning to form along the edges right there? Like stuff like that starts to happen, right? When you have five-sided faces right there. So this wasn't like the nightmare example I was hoping it was gonna be, but it was still like, when you go to smooth it, you're gonna run into some major, major issues um, when you uh, have faces with more than four sides to them. And so when you bevel something, that's just to say that um, you want it to go all the way around an object here. So again, I'm gonna extrude a, face right here. And remember, you, you can't extrude an edge or a face. I'm going to show how to, uh, sorry, you can bevel an edge or a face, but I'll show bevels first. And so again, um, uh, right here. So you can create the, the bevel. And remember, you can type in your own numbers right here, which is what I recommend doing. Um, one thing to remember too, is when you're adding segments into it, keep in mind, um, when, try to plan out, are you planning on smoothing your object later or are you not? If you're planning on smoothing your object later, you, um, you probably don't need too many segments right here, right? You could probably get around with three because when you, whenever you smooth it, that number is going to double. Whenever you smooth something, the geometry doubles on the object. So let me just show that real quick is if I smooth it. I um, have to select it first and have it in objects mode before I smooth. Um, but you can see things round out a whole lot, but you can see that the number just doubled in the amount of segments right there. So just kind of keep in mind when you're creating bevels in your objects, uh, do you plan on smoothing it later or do you not? And if you're not planning on smoothing it later, you might want more segments in here. Um, and if you do plan on smoothing it more, just take note that your geometry amount is going to double. And so you can get away with half as many segments for a bevel. Um, one reason that you want to have enough geometry in a model is, let me turn on wireframe unshaded right here, is if there's not enough geometry in a model, when you get, and this will become clear when you go to render it, um, 
but if there's not enough geometry, so I intentionally have not too much geometry in this bevel right now, is you have something, and this is um, called faceting. And what faceting is, is it means you're trying to get a rounded edge, but you end up with an edge with sharp points on it. Like imagine like an old video game, you know, there's a lot of faceting. So sometimes if you're trying to emulate an old video game, you might have low geometry on purpose. But if you're trying to create something realistic, there's little that kind of takes the realism away from an object quicker than if the audience can see these hard edges forming where things are supposed to be round, right? So that's called faceting. And it's something to look out for modeling, particularly if you're trying to model something realistic right here. And um, that's a reason to have more geometry rather than less. And it's always just a counterbalance that you're you're trying to reach or a balance you're trying to reach between having enough geometry where it's not faceting and then not too much geometry where it's becoming a headache to deal with your model. Um, and just keep in mind if you're ever in question, it's always easier to add more geometry later than it is to take away geometry. That's kind of my main note. If you're trying to weigh that question at any point is whenever you want to add geometry, there's a ton of ways where, um, and I'll show this tool you know, down the road, but you can add tons of geometry in like two seconds if you want to. Um, and if you want to take away geometry, it's a little bit more of a process and it can kind of cause some more headaches for you. So um, general rule of thumb, try to try to model in a way that's a little low poly and you can usually add that geometry in later, either using tools um, like the multi-cut, which I'll show down the road, or using tools like the smooth button where you just double your geometry with the click of a button here. Um, Okay, so let me set up a scenario here where I'll show you an instance where you might want to bevel using uh, faces rather than edges. So I'll just need to set this up for one sec. Oops, sorry. Okay, so um, similar to um, if when you're working in your different modes right here, so we have object mode, right? And then you have vertex, edge, and face mode. Um, similar to these modes where when you're selecting one vertex, you're only selecting one point at a time right here. And then if you select an edge, you're selecting two points. And then if you're selecting a face, you're selecting four points. Um, Think about beveling in a similar way. So if I'm beveling an edge, I am going to bevel, uh, create a bevel that looks, oops. Uh, what am I doing? Okay, so if you're beveling one edge, and I'll press F to focus on it, and I press bevel, you're, cre you're creating one bevel at a time. And let me make this bevel much smaller right here. So I might need to type in a number, um, 0 0.04 right here. And I'm gonna create a small bevel, give it three segments. And so that's the results you might get when uh, beveling an edge. And beveling faces is similar, but let's say that I wanna bevel both um, this edge, this down here that I'm selecting right there. And I want to also bevel this edge right here. And I want the bevels to be identical to one another. In that case, I could bevel this edge down here and then type in some numbers and then bevel this edge up here and then type in some numbers and, and then match them up. And that would work and that would be totally fine. But you can also start beveling faces in this case. And this is a good example of when you might want to bevel faces. And so I'll right click, go to face mode, and then just drag and select those faces right there. Um, press four to make sure I got the right ones, press five to go back. And if I bevel this, we'll get a different result. So you can see right here, let me type in point 0.1 to get it a little more manageable. You can see that I have a bevel up here and then a bevel down here on either side of the face, right? Um, that keeps that's identical to one another. So if I add um, three segments, it adds it to the top and the bottom right there. So um, whenever you bevel faces, um, just keep in mind that it's going to bevel on 
uh, the lower side of the face and then the upper side of the face at the same time right here. Um, and uh, that's good if, again, you're in this scenario right here where you want to bevel two edges at the same time and they're both contained on either side of the face right here. Um, in my experience, most of the time, pretty much the vast majority of the time, you're going to be wanting to bevel an edge, though. So most of the time, you want to just select an edge that goes all the way around your model um, right here. And it's, uh, be really careful to make sure that you only select the edges that go around um, to make that edge loop there. If, for instance, I select a stray edge like that, you can see right here that this edge right here is a stray edge. And then I press bevel. That's also going to cause your model to um, have some problems. So um, just be sure whenever you're selecting edge loops, just to press 4 real quick to go to wireframe mode. And then double check and deselect any stray edges that are not creating that edge loop that go all the way around your model. Again, that's really important that it goes all the way around. Um, let's see here. So does anyone have any questions on the bevel right here? OK, so everyone try it out and uh, mess around with your model here. And I'll kind of uh, go around and, and check on everyone's work here. And after that, we'll kind of pick things up from there. All right, everyone. So I'm not going to jump into a full lecture here before we go on to break, but this is just something I thought of that I wanted to show you all real quick. So just take a quick look up on the screen if you can. So um, if you remember uh, uh, last class, one thing that I went over that I didn't uh, kind of recap here today was the um, uh, extruding with, with uh, keep faces together is off. And I'll kind of briefly talk about that, but there's something uh, also I want to kind of bring up here to kind of build off of that. So remember, if you want to kind of extrude out a gear or something like that, I, su I suggest if you're working off of a cylinder and you want to extrude out a gear, just go to the orthographic view to select these faces. Because again, instead of trying to come up with a difficult selection in the perspective view, you can just go to the side, drag like this, and then you got the selection easy peasy right there. But then um, when you go to extrude, you just click where it says off right there on keep faces together off. And then what you can do is press F to focus on it. You can see my controls are really small, so I'll just press the plus sign. And what I need to do is I need to drag these boxes, these box controls to scale in each face. But remember, you need to drag them the correct way, because if I drag it the wrong way, I'll get the, uh, that zebra situation, right? So what you need to do is I'll grab what for me is the red box and the, um, the green. And it's basically whatever two boxes are are running um, alongside your faces and not facing outwards. So just one, two, and then I'll press Q, extrude again. Then this time, so this is my second extrusion. I'm using the blue arrow to pull it out right there. And then also take note that now that I have all these pulled out with these faces selected, I can press Q again, and I can press uh, bevel right here. And I can bevel all these at the same time right here. So do you see that how all these spaces are currently um, selected right here after creating the extrusion? And with them still selected right there, you can do things like create bevel, and I'll do them all at the same time. And if I type in a, a value right here, it does it for all of them at the same time right there. So I might do 0.25, add um, something like three segments in there. And now I have um, a bunch of extruded kind of areas like that that are rounded off on the edges right there. So um, that's one thing to keep in mind as an example of how you can start combining extrude and bevel together. But um, there's something else I wanted to show here, which is when you are creating a cylinder, and I'm just going to start with a default cylinder right here and scale it up. If I press, uh, and let's say that I add some subdivisions in it this way. Um, one thing that I saw a lot last semester, and I kind of forgot to tell people this, and it kind of showed up in a lot of projects, and I want to try to avoid that this time, is if you press three on this cylinder right here, and you smooth it, and um, take a look at the geometry of it right here, you can see that it's making a kind of like a pumpkin shape to it. It's those same ridges I was talking about when you have five-sided faces right there. I'm not sure how clear that's showing up in the screen for everybody, but you can see kind of going along the edges right there. 
when I press three, it's kind of making a pretty unpleasant kind of like pumpkin shape. Let's see if I add more edges this way, if it gets a little worse. So it gets a little worse as I add more segments in there. And so if you want, like if you're making like a pill or something like that, and you wanted to have like a nice kind of rounded shape to it, the way to avoid that is you just need to make sure that you have subdivision caps along the um, this these faces right here. So always just make sure if you plan on it, um, uh, smoothing out a cylinder that you have faces going along the top and the bottom right here. And now um, when I press three, you can see that the, the smooth is a lot cleaner right there. And the only difference that happened there, the only difference that happened was in one, I had it, oops, I had it at its default right here. So a default cylinder, when you press three and smooth it, it gets that weird kind of shape going along it. And the way to avoid getting that weird shape when you smooth a cylinder is all you need to do is when you're doing your initial setup. And again, this is a little hard to, it's, pretty, it's, it's a little more difficult to add this geometry in later. So it's really important that you do it as your first step is under subdivision caps, which is the last area where you add subdivisions. Just add a few subdivisions in here because what it's doing is it's reading this kind of pie shaped geometry right here. And you can see the reason it's causing problems right there is we have um, all of these faces going into one vertice right here, which is um, not as bad as an ingon, which is a five-sided face, but it's kind of getting towards that territory, right? And so it's um, that's what's causing that kind of pie shape is the fact that all of, all of these faces are going into that one vertice right there. So, and again, to avoid that, I'll just press one. It's so like the model, I'm in the attribute editor and the subdivision caps right here at the bottom. Just give it really any number right here. I think even three will be fine right there just to round it out. So um, that's just a quick and easy way to avoid some weird looking geometry right there. Um, does anyone have any questions about that? Okay, so um, it's 4.15 right now. Let's take a uh, 15 minute break and we'll meet back up at 4.30 and I'll show you all. I'll keep kind of adding on some new things for y'all to learn here. All right, everyone. Um, so the people online, can you hear me okay? Cool, thank you. Um, okay, so um, and are y'all able to see my screen? Cool, great. Okay, so the the next thing I want to go over here is how to create a psych. Um, so a psych is a helpful photography um, tool, and it's a little hard to tell in these photographs, but these are two photographs of psychs here. And um, using psychs in your renders can be really helpful in um, creating like a, a nice looking, well-rounded render where uh, especially modeling where you don't want the background to necessarily be taking over your image here. And so you can see right here, a psych is an, a surface. And if you look along this edge where my mouse is going right here, it's a curved surface like that. And the purpose of it is it's really useful for instance, like product photography and things like that. Um, and it makes it so that you don't see like a hard edge where the floor hits the wall. And um, it uh, can be helpful for creating some good renders here. And I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly, I could be wrong on this, but most of the renders that I showed in the assignment guideline use Sykes in the background. This is incredibly common for modelers um, in Maya and uh, when, you're, when they're presenting models to uh, put it into a Psych environment like this to come up with the best renders possible here. So this is going to be kind of a two for one where I show you how to create one of these, which will help start to set us up for eventually moving into lighting and um, setting up the camera in Maya. So kind of taking a step. This is going to be another modeling exercise, but it's going to set us up to start moving into other areas and branching out a little bit. Um, but it's also going to be showing a particular extrusion technique here. So um, this extrusion technique is going to be mostly familiar to you all, but it's going to be a slight difference. And essentially, what we're going to do here is we're going to extrude edges rather than faces here. 
And so to create a psych, it's, it's actually a pretty simple process when you kind of boil it down. But we're going to start off with a plane, which is this button right here. So you can create a polygon plane just by clicking on this button right here or going up to create poly primitives and then finding plane right here. And so this is going to be the floor. And you can um, just scale it up by pressing R and um, grabbing the center box. I'm going to press W and just move it off of the, the grid so that the grid's not interfering with our vision right now. And so it'll be good to do a practice one of these and then do a real one in, in a moment here. So if you remember, when you smooth an object in Maya, the amount of curvature that happens in the smoothing depends on how much space there is between the geometry right here. And um, so we're just going to keep that in mind. And so if you want your psych to have um, a really gradual kind of incline and bevel like this, you're going to want to let have less geometry. And if you want it to have more of like a tight like lip to it like that, you're going to want it to have more geometry. Um, so I'll show that. So um, to create a psych, I'm going to start just by creating what is the simpler psych, which is like what we have in um, this picture right here, where we have a floor, and then we have a wall, and then a connecting area right there. And so first thing I'm going to do is I have my floor right here, and I'm going to go into the attribute editor before I really make any adjustments to it, and I'm going to go to the third tab right down to the subdivision width height right here. And it's at 10 right now, and I might just take it down. I'm going to set this to a low number to demonstrate the gradual curve right here. So I'm going to bring it to four and four right here. So again, I just created a plane right here, went over to the attribute editor, went to the third tab, and then just changed the subdivisions to four and four. And what numbers you change these to, it depends on what the final product is you want. So you don't have to have it at four and four, but that's just what I'm doing here. And remember before we were extruding faces. So we go into face mode, we'd select a face and we go over to the modeling toolkit and press extrude. And we'd extrude out a face like that, right? Um, but in this instance, I'm working with a flat plane and um, so when you're working with flat planes, you can extrude edges. And this is actually, this technique of extruding edges like this is gonna come up later when we get into really complicated modeling. Um, sometimes I'll use this to model cars and things like that, um, where I'm kind of modeling it through this um, uh, iteration, a much more complicated iteration of this technique I'm showing right here. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna right click, go to edge mode, select these four edges along that side right there. And I'm just going to hold shift and click one, two, three, four across them. Since this is a flat object, I don't really need to do the wireframe thing, right? And I'm just going to select those four edges right there. So whatever edges go along one edge or one edge of your face right there. And then here, I'm just going to press extrude and change my angle to something like this. And here, I'm just going to do a blue arrow straight up like this. And what I'm going to do is so I just did the blue arrow up. So I didn't grab the, any of the boxes. I just did, for me, what was the blue arrow, pulling it vertically up. And I'm going to add some divisions into this. So um, for divisions, I might have it be an equal number, something like that. So I have it set to four and four. And so let me just undo that so I can show that one more time. So again, I just create the, the plane, right click, edge, one, two, holding shift, three, four, go over to the modeling toolkit, down to extrude here. I'm doing the blue arrow, pulling it up, and then giving it uh, something like four divisions right here. So it's the fourth down right there under the extrude menu. And I'll press Q to just go to the select mode to get out of the extrude button mode right there. And from here, where we basically got it, it's um, if I press three right here, you can see that it rounds out right there. And we've got a psych. And if you're building an environment, um, you might want to make the psych a little wider. And so you can just go to the scale tool right here and then drag it out that way and give yourself a little more space. 
And so you can continue to make some adjustments to this. If you want to give it more space, if you want to say, for instance, you want to make the floor go out more to the left over here, what I would su suggest doing is you have a few options. But one option you could do is you could select these edges right here. And there's if we, if we look at those from the side right here, they're totally flat right there. So we don't really even need to extrude them. We can just press W, pull it out like that with the edges and kind of adjust this. Similarly, if we want the ceiling to be higher, same thing. One, two, three, four. Press W and I can scale it up that way. And in terms of geometry, since the floor is flat, there's not really any geometry information that I need in it. So it's not really important for the floor in these areas, right? Like these spaces right here, where it's um, completely flat. Under there, it's not important that I have a ton of geometry in there because it's a flat surface and there, there's just no need for an, abund an overabundance of information for the computer to have to deal with there. So you can see right there that I created it with um, uh, four right there. But I could also, if I want the site, the site to have a different incline, so you can see if we look at it from the side that with, um, and I'll press one again to go back to that mode, that I had um, geometry in all directions that was four. And when I press smooth, I end up with an incline like that. Um, one thing you might notice here is, let me just move this over to the side. And I'm gonna do a similar thing here. And so I'll create a plane. I'll scale it up using this tool right here move it up and go to the attribute editor. And this time I might just bring it down to, let's just bring it to two and two this time. And this also depends on the scale of it a little bit, but I'm gonna do the same thing. So edge one, two this time, and I'll extrude it. So just selecting those two edges and extruding, and then I'll pull it up here and I'll give it just two divisions right here. And this time, when I smooth it, you can see it's more rounded. Do you see how compared to this one right here? I had uh, four subdivisions right there in this model. And it's got a little bit more of a steep curve to it right there on the site. And then in this version right here, I had um, a lot less geometry. It was just on two and two in terms of subdivisions right there. And I have a more rounded one right there. Typically for Sykes, you want it to be the, uh, as round as possible, honestly. So the less geometry, the better most of the time. Most of the time I would rather have this, the Sykes that's to the right than the Sykes that's to the left right there. Um, so one other thing too, is you can make adjustments to this after the fact here. So let's just say, that I've made, I'm gonna delete the psych over here. And let's say I have the psych right here. And I think to myself, I want this to be even more rounded. Something I can do is if I press one right here, I can right click and go to edge mode, select that edge right there, press W or the move tool right here, and then just move it up a little bit. Same thing down here, one, two, drag it away. And be sure to use the arrows and not this box right here, right? Because we're getting wonky there. So we just want to use the arrows. And now if I press three, it's getting more, more gradual right there, more rounded. That's the way smoothing works. And this is a really important concept to understand in modeling when you're smoothing here is the further away the geometry is, the more rounded the, smooth, the smoothing is going to be. So right here, we have a really rounded um, smooth function happening right there. I'm going to press one again to go back to normal. But then if I bring this edge and I bring it tighter in there, so I'm going to select both of these edges and bring them in tighter right here, something like this. All right. So, and again, I just went into edge mode and then I use the move tool to move those edges and slide them around. And now when I press three, you can see that bevel is really abrupt right there. And so um, that's an important thing to keep in mind when you're modeling, because a lot of the times when you're modeling more complicated objects, and this is gonna come up through the classes, we get to more and more complicated things, is 
we're going to build things up with relatively simple geometry and then use the smooth function to bring it to that next level of complexity. And it's important to know what's going to happen to your model when you press smooth. And um, so for instance, and again, so it's just all about the proximity of the geometry to one another when they smooth here. So just to kind of give another example here is, uh, so move this to the side. So I have a cylinder right here. And remember if I press three right here, it looks like a pumpkin because I didn't add any subdivisions in there. But um, actually let's do it with a, let's do this with a cube. So with a cube, if I press uh, three and smooth it, it, it turns all the way into like a ball, for instance, right there. And then same thing, if I press one, add subdivisions to it right here. And then I press three to smooth it. You see right there, it becomes more of like a beveled box right there. Um, so just to keep in mind with all those subdivisions in there, this cube, when I smooth it, or press three to preview a smooth, it turns into more of like a beveled box situation. And when I have the subdivisions back to the basic setting right here, it turns all the way into a ball, right? And so that's an important concept to understand when it comes to smoothing. And it's particularly important with a psych right here. And so this is a good example of a psych right here. Um, and Again, it's hard to overestimate like how distracting if you have um, a model that you want to kind of show off in 3D, how distracting it can be to have that hard edge of where a floor meets a, a wall going on in the background. So building a psych is something that's really important to do in modeling. Um, and uh, hopefully this tutorial helps with it, but just um, last time, and I'm going to do it real quick this time, is you create a plane by cl uh, clicking on this button and in the attribute editor, take the subdivisions. I, I bring it down to like two right here, two and two, in the attribute editor. And you can just select two edges like that and then go to the modeling toolkit, extrude, do the blue arrow up and give it at least one sub two subdivisions in there. And once you have that right there, you're pretty much ready um, with the psych. You also have the option too, um, let me press undo a few times, is most of the time when I build a psych, I build it like that, where it's just one wall where you're rounding it up. But if you wanna have like the corner of a room, for instance, you can have two walls. So I can select uh, all the edges going around like this. So that would be one, two, three, four edges right there. And then I can press extrude. I need to press one to get out of smooth preview. So I'm back in normal preview. And here I can add, give it divisions and I'll press Q when I'm done. And so for this one, I press three, you have more of a rounded um, corner psych right here. It looks like this. And if I press, um, this button, we can see what it might look like in a render. So you can kind of see how that rounds it out at the bottom and you don't have to deal with the, the floor showing up within your renders right there. Um, so uh, that's how to build a psych. And I would encourage you all to kind of have that going on, particularly once we start moving into lighting and rendering here. Um, and it depends somewhat on what you're trying to do with your renders, but if you want this um, the focus to be on your model, then this is a, a good technique to keep in mind right here. Um, one thing that's important here is I showed that you can extrude um, edges here, but the only time you ever want to extrude edges, and I do extrude edges a lot, but I only extrude edges when I start with a flat object like a plane like this one right here. And the reason for that is it kind of goes back to the kind of like the bad polygons that I was, I've been talking about before, like the endons and things like that. That does, um, let's see here. So if I click on this and um, 
Oh, that's right. I always forget the name of it. Uh, it's called non-manifold geometry. Um, when you um, have a face sticking out of geometry right here. So an example of when you don't want to extrude an edge is when you have a, a fully formed three-dimensional object like this one right here, just any kind of basic cube, for instance, um, any of these objects. Because what happens here, and I'm going to show it, is normally when you extrude, you can uh, just select a face, which is what you're mo doing most of the time with a, a fully formed object like this, rather than a flat surface like that, is you're extruding a face and, oops, and you're pulling it out there. And then when you go to preview smooth at three, it looks you know like uh, an object that you want right here. Um, and then alternatively, Let's flip it to the other side. Let's say that I have a three-dimensional object here, like the cube, and then I right-click, go to edge. I select an edge and only extrude the edge here. And so I'll extrude the edge, pull it out right there. And you can see right here, you remember what I was talking about where you want your, your model to appear gray right here. You can see on the back, it's appearing black right there. And that's a sign that things are going poorly. And if I press three, it can cause some just like some weird things to happen here with your model right there. Uh, and this happens a lot with character modeling and stuff like that, and it can get really hairy right there. The reason that it's okay in the psych is again, that it's a flat object. And the fact that we have um, the gray faces are kind of always pointing to the camera in the situation, so that's fine. But since and on the back is appearing black, um, but it's a, it's a flat object, right? And it's facing away from the camera. So it's just, it's not going to be a problem for you in this situation here. Um, let's see here. Does anyone have any questions about what a psych is, why you would want a psych, and extruding edges, which is what I just showed in terms of creating a psych here? Cool. OK. So um, uh, online, are you all doing OK? All right, so um, give that a shot. I want everyone here to try to make a psych. You can either try to make one like this or uh, make one that is like that. Um, either one's fine. And it's just an important thing to have in your arsenal to, to just know how to make those well and be able to incorporate them for uh, renders because it's uh, it helps the renders come out nicer a lot of the time if you use them. All right, so um, let's see. A limited amount of time left, but OK, I think that's OK. Um, so the next thing I want to kind of begin to introduce here a little bit is how to create a camera in Maya and uh, use a camera. So uh, what I want to do first is um, to lead up to that is I want to bring you back to the, the two view. Remember, we have the one view right here. We have the four view right here, which is this button, or you can tap space bar, or you can press this one right here, which goes to the two view. And if you remember, so just if you press this button, this right there, that'll bring you to the two view. And on the two view, uh, this can be helpful sometimes because you usually want to have access to your perspective view, but I use this view a lot when I'm modeling, for instance, is I want a reference of my model from like the front or the side. And I'm usually working on a laptop where I don't have like this 30 inch screen where I can have all four views up and be able to see things clearly. And one thing to keep in mind is you can customize which view this is. Um, so right now it's set to the front view right there if you see where my cursor is. But if you go, if you want to set it to be, let's say for instance, the top view, you can go to panels, orthographic, and then you can choose between different, different view modes right there. So I can go to top right there so I can see my objects from the top. I can go to panels, orthographic and go to the side right here and I can see my model from the side which helps me see the curve right there. Um, and I can also go to panels. So we have the orthographic views which are all right here. Um, but I can also 
you know, have a second view of my perspective if for some reason I wanted that. And so um, that can cause a little bit of confusion right there. But um, so the main concept here, though, is that no matter whether you're in four view, two view, or one view, you can always go up to here in panels and customize what you're seeing right here. So, um, and I just wanted to show that for the two view because this is going to be important for setting up a camera. So again, I uh, press this button right here. So it went to two views, went to panels up here, clicked it, and I went to orthographic and then top to switch it to my top view. So I'm going to tap space bar and just go back to my one view mode here. And what I want to show you is how to create a camera. And there's a lot of advantages to creating a camera. Um, and it's something you're going to want to do for your renders, um, both whether you're using in this class where we're rendering stills or down the road, if you're doing animation, you're going to want to set up cameras so that you can dolly it and um, you know create camera moves for your animations. So. To create a camera, it's uh, really simple. You just go up to create, and then down here under cameras right here, and then it's the first option right there. So I'm going to leave that up for a second. Um, so it's create cameras, and then you go to the top option, which is camera. And if you click it, a little camera should show up in your, in your screen right here. It might appear small right there. And so I'm leaving that menu up on the side. So create cameras and then camera, if you need to put that in your notes or anything like that. And you can see that in my perspective view, a camera pops into the middle of my scene. It should always pop up right in the center of your grid right there. Um, and it's a default camera. And so the next question is, is how do I look through this camera, right? So, or how do you reposition it and all that stuff as well. So one thing you can do too is you can move the camera. So you can just select it. It's naturally in object mode. So you can move it and rotate and rotate it and do all that good stuff to it. But what you really want to be able to do is see through the camera so you can aim it as if you're looking through a camera in real life. So what I need to be able to do here is you can go up to, and I'll keep this simple. I'm just going to stay in the one view mode right here. But a lot of the times I might switch to the two view mode to do this. Um, you know what, I'm going to just do it in the two-view mode. So I'll go to panels uh, in the two-view mode. Sorry to change my mind in the middle of that. So I'll go to the two-view mode, which is um, this button right here. Go up in the second view to panels, perspective. So this, that camera is showing up under the perspective menu right there. And then if I switch this to camera, that window, that window to my left is now going to be looking through the camera that we just created right there. Um, so the second view mode, go up to panels, perspective, and then camera. You click on it, and now I'm looking through this camera. You can see the camera is also showing up as an object in my outliner right here. So you can see that I have my plane, which is my psych, and I can just rename that my psych, which is spelled like that. And I can select my camera as well. And moving your camera is exactly the same as moving your perspective view. So it's going to be a little weird at first, but there we go. Press F. And you can see right here, that I'm able to kind of position my camera right here. And then I have my perspective view right here. And the reason that you want to have uh, something separate from your perspective view is I always use the perspective view to just navigate around my scene, see what's going on, help, help me model. And then the camera, you're setting up what you want your final render to be, whether that's an animation or if it's a still render, you're trying to set up your final product here. Um, and there's several advantages to using a camera right here is the perspective view, for instance, you can't um, thinking ahead to animation is you can't animate your perspective view, but you can animate a camera, right? So if you're animating a scene with 3D characters and you wanna um, have your, your camera dolly in on the scene, you can animate a, a begin point and an end point for your camera and set those keyframes. So you can do that. Um, and then there's also some helpful things you can do with the camera as well, which is what I'm about to show here, which is, and I'm going to need to rush a little bit since we're running out of time. And I'll kind of pick this back up on Tuesday's class. But um, so I, in my two view mode, I hovered my cursor over the camera view and I tap space bar right here. In the camera mode, um, there's a few buttons up here, which I'm going to want to go up to 
um, go over in the future, but I'm going to stick with the most basic one that, that exists up there, the most basic two, let's say. Um, so we have uh, this button right here, which um, if you see it, it's a little camera with a lock next to it. So you can click it and you'll see it'll outline green and it locks the camera. So now when I hold option or, or alt and I try to move it, my camera's locked in position, right? So once you find a camera view that you really like, you can lock it in right there using this button right here. Um, this button helps you select the camera. So if you look in my outliner right now, or if you look in the perspective view, my psych is currently selected. And if I want to select the camera itself, I can either find it in the outliner right here, or I can click on this button right here, which is the one furthest to the left, and that'll select the camera for you right there if you ever need to select the camera. Um, and then finally, there's this button right here, which opens the camera attributes, which you can just do by selecting the camera itself and then going to the attribute editor here. And you can see here is the final advantage to having a, a camera set up in your scene is we have all these controls and sliders that we can set up for the camera here. So um, let me zoom in a little bit and I'm going to create a donut in the scene. And I'm going to select my camera, which I can do just by clicking either this button right here or clicking this button right here. And I can do things like change the focal length. So um, changing the focal length is really important in establishing a scene here. Um, is So right now, by default, it's set at 35 millimeters, which is like a typical kind of wide-ish angle lens right here. Um, and if I want to change my focal length, which is going to greatly affect the way that your renders come out. Um, and I'm going to actually, since we're running out of time, I'm going to go over this in a lot more detail, but you can kind of change the numbers here. So let's say I change this to 200. It looks like it zooms in on things and it kind of flattens out the space a little bit in your render. Um, so you can set things to like 200 for the focal length and it greatly changes the way things look. 35 was the default right here. So it looks like that. And then finally, if you type in like a wide angle lens number, like 12, you get like a, a wide angle look right here. So if you're going for like a Terry Gilliam look or something here, you can just um, type in a number like 14 or 12 and get something where perspective gets greatly exaggerated in your scene here. Um, and there's more, there's a lot more to go over with the camera and I'll pick that up. That's where we'll pick things up uh, in Tuesday's class. But just keep in mind that to, um, if you want to delete a camera, you can find it in the outliner right here, select it, press delete, it's gone. Um, to create a camera, all you need to do is go up to create, go down to below poly primitives, which is, this is the menu we've been using up to this point. You go down to cameras and you select camera right here. And you can see right here, it creates a camera down there in the scene. And in order to look through the camera, this is the thing that trips people up the most often, is you need to go to um, panels perspective and then go to camera right there to be able to look through your camera. So panels perspective camera. I'm now looking through the camera and I can look through it the way I would the perspective view. And with the camera, remember the advantages are is you can animate it, you can lock it, so you can lock it off and start setting up your lighting. And being able to lock off your camera is super important when establishing your lighting in a scene because you're going to be wanting to do a lot of um, trial and error with any kind of lighting setup. And then finally, with a camera, uh, the last advantage is you can change things like you can add depth of field into your scene. You can do photography tricks right, with your renders. So you can add depth of field, you can change the focal length, and you can get creative um, with setting up the the, the camera work for your renders here. So um, let's see here. Does that make sense to anybody? Does any, everybody, does anybody have any questions for me about creating a camera and positioning it in the scene? Okay, so um, uh, great. So on Tuesday's class, we'll pick things back up and we'll kind of start with cameras and uh, move on from there.
put there. I don't know if like I have enough of this stuff to get to the computer. Well, I'll walk you to the Yeah, we'll get we'll get to Yeah, um, yeah, how about this weekend? I'm here, not too busy. Yeah.